Hello and welcome to Rhino's Retrospectives, where we take a look back at some of the older games. Since this year there are going to be a lot of Nintendo games on either a 5th or a 10th anniversary, I want to dive back into some of them and see what made them so good in the first place. I'm returning to these games in the same order that I experienced them, so expect things to be really out of place. It's part of the reason why we're doing Majora's Mask first. But personally, I do feel that it makes a difference. Depending on when you experience a game in a series will change up how you feel about it. You could have played the final game first, or the first game last, through no fault of your own. And the order that you play these games in will have a significant impact on how you feel about them. So with that out of the way, let's hop on into talking about Majora's Mask. A game that is now old enough to drink, and the series itself is old enough to be an unemployed man floating around on a balloon wearing a green suit, searching for his beloved fairy that he will never receive. Growing up as a nerd in the 90s and 2000s, you fell into one of two groups, either Nintendo or PlayStation. And while there was that third group of people who liked Sonic the Hedgehog too much, that will be a different video for some other time. Having two brothers, we fell into the Nintendo tribe so that way we could all play together. And while the games appeared more childish, Zelda set out as one of those few mature series. And by mature, I mean, Mom, I'm already 13, I'm practically an adult. So Majora's Mask is every semi-edgy millennial's favorite game. At least when it comes to Zelda. I still remember the day that I unraveled the N64 cartridge, fresh from the pawn shop, free from two layers of sweatshirts, all the way back on October 10th, 2001. I was extremely happy that there was already a 100% complete save from the previous owner, so I could occasionally just hop over and check to see what was in store for me in the future. We probably rented or borrowed it from a friend, but now we had our own copy to play, and good lord was I excited. We then spent probably about 8 years throwing our faces into the wall, never being able to beat the damn game, until puberty hit, and I could finally understand what in God's name I actually had to do. While the game isn't as complex as a lot of other N64 games, or Zelda games in general, it keeps a lot of that open world aspect to it, where it just lets you kind of go out and discover things on your own. Granted, Majora's Mask is much more limited in how much it lets you explore at a time, preventing you from entering new areas without getting the dungeon item from the previous dungeon, or sometimes a mask that's required to press forward. Just from my replay, I saw a lot of areas is that gradually get more and more difficult as the game goes along. Essentially, within the first two hours, you can easily beat the first dungeon and about halfway to the second one. But from there on, the game starts kind of getting thickened out a little bit, I guess you could say. The tasks and the mini dungeons that are required to get the items actually go to the big dungeons and fight the big bosses get really long and time consuming at some points. For example, you can blaze through the Deku Palace in about 15 or so minutes, but by the time you get to Tarmania, it's probably going to clock you in about an hour in order to collect all the baby Zoras. And then once you're done with that, you need to go through a massive hassle in order to get to the final dungeon. Like, I'm talking, you gotta do that big trading quest with the zombies. You need to free the dad from his curse. You need to go into the castle and fight the two boneheads in order to finally be able to unlock the song that unlocks the entrance to the dungeon, which is then the most complex dungeon in the game and probably one of the more complex ones in Zelda. A lot of this can be forgiven though, because when you look back at the early 2000s, you wanted to have a girthy game. You wanted it to be really padded out with content, so that way people would just play it for a long time. The 3DS remake didn't take these away, but they did kind of shorten up some of them to streamline the process, as you can kind of expect. It wasn't trimmed down as much as the Water Temple from the 3DS version of Ocarina of Time, but it was cut down in order to make things a bit easier. Everyone already knows about how Majora's Mask came to be. But for those who don't, for some reason, here's a quick Cliff Notes version. Essentially, the game had a super short dev time, it had a very reduced budget, and they flipped these assets to make everything work. But these limitations tended to be more of benefits to the developers. That's how ideas came about, like the whole three-day time limit, and the ability to set time backwards and starting all over again. It was one of those cases where limitations breed innovations. And all that really means is that in order to be successful, you gotta work with what you got. If you have less opportunities, you need to work harder with them. And without going on a 45 minute lecture on meritocracy, we'll just leave that right there. But some of these innovations came in things like the mask system, 
where now instead of having Link have all these different items, you can consolidate several of them into the individual masks. So for example, the Gorin is kind of a fusion between the Megaton Hammer and the Gorin Tunic, the same way that the Zora is a fusion between the Iron Boots, the Boomerang, and the Zora Tunic. You consolidate all these things into one easier character that allows you to not only save dev time, but it saves the player time in switching between the menus a lot, which is one thing that a lot of people had problems with in the original Ocarina of Time, having to go in and out of those menus just to change up your boots or something like that. I'm not gonna lie, I'm a big softie for a sad story, and I think Majora's Mask is the biggest reason why. It's incredibly rich in both environmental and direct storytelling. And I think that the most recent game that made me feel as moved as Majora's Mask did was Death Stranding. See the sunset, the day is ending. Majora's Mask feels very special when compared to a lot of other Nintendo games. For one, it's really dark, it's got a depressing story, and while we do get some of that later in games like Breath of the Wild, which have that same dark story aspect, they're never really driven home in the way that they are in Majora's Mask. There's a lot of open sadness, there's grief, there's anger, there's misery, and it's all pretty clearly shown. Granted, in a way that's more digestible for children, as opposed to, you know, having something just downright horrific and depressing, it's a much more subtle feel about it. Kind of like how Disney is able to convey deep messages through a lighthearted tone or a lot of bright visuals. Speaking of grief, a lot of people often equate the story to the stages of grief. How you go from things like anger and denial and bargaining in order to try and, you know, come to terms with something that happened. And while those are all aspects of the game, the devs have openly spoken that they wanted to show that there's a little bit of everything around the world. It's not so one note per region as it might seem to begin with. Things like while there's a massive apocalypse looming in the future, the Deku Kingdom just loses their mind and they are looking for anyone to persecute for something wrong that happened to them. The Gorin people are searching for a hero to save them from this uh, unending winter. The Zoras are afraid that their species are going to die out. A lot of them are some pretty deep existential fears and things that, you know, kids wouldn't normally think about, but they're in a kid's game, and it kind of helps develop that little bit of a more adult feeling that a lot of other Zelda games have. Apart from those grand storylines, there's all these small ones too. Things about like the two sisters who can't complete their dance routine, or the two other sisters who are being relentlessly attacked by aliens, which are in this game uh, for some reason. The world feels really alive for an N64 game. And the fact that people have their own routines that are all designed around a ticking clock kind of just makes it feel more real. Speaking of that ticking clock, that's one of those big features in the game. There's this constant feeling of dread with the fact that you only have the three days to finish things. And the fact that each hour in game is only about 27 seconds means that you really only have about 32 minutes per game session before the moon hits. There's also the ability to slow time down even further so you have more time to do things, but it still adds that little bit of how much can I do for the rest of the day and what is worth it or should I just restart already. It's a great player motivator. Sometimes it'll overextend and have to lose a lot of progress. Or you might just withhold yourself a little bit further and not quite do as much as you could. It changes up the feeling of the story depending on how you want to play it. And while there are a lot of games that do that nowadays, back in the early 2000s, it was nowhere near as common. Normally I would gush about how great the music is, but you've been listening to it for the entire retrospective so far. I think it's pretty clear that some of my favorite songs are the Stone Tower, both the regular and the inverted one. It just sounds so weird and a little bit creepy even. I mean, I'm wearing a King Gizzard shirt right now, so you can tell that I probably enjoy the weird sh Compared to modern Zeldas, the game mostly holds up. I feel that the bosses are probably the weakest part of the game. While they are unique battles, they're just way too easy. The 3DS remake did a little bit to kind of change us up by making the bosses a little bit different, but it actually made most of them easier and just one of them way, way, way harder. In fact, I think that it took me almost 45 minutes to defeat the Twin Rova fight just because it was poorly explained and I couldn't understand what the hell to do. And the trade-off there is that the boss fight felt a little bit cooler for the first five or so minutes. But then when you get stuck and you feel like an idiot in this ancient game, 
it's not fun at all. And as a way to really rub salt in the wound, when you complete the game 100%, you really put all of your effort into it and you've unlocked everything. Your reward is the Fierce Deity Mask, which turns Link into an awesome powerhouse. The problem is with that awesome mask, there's nothing that is near strong enough to even hold its own against you. Even the final boss goes down in no time. This is in a game that encourages you to go back and fight the bosses again at an earlier point during the three day cycle so that way you can do more in the areas. It just wasn't thought out as far as it could have been and I would blame most of that to the time that was lost in the development. With those bosses aside though, everything about this just screams perfect Zelda. The dungeons flow nicely but don't hold your hand. Each area is unique and the environments are fitting. There's even some areas that were originally cut from Ocarina of Time that were repurposed into levels for Majora's Mask. Things like the Ice Dungeon, which was originally going to be in Ocarina of Time, but was cut due to time constraints there. They took a lot of those features in the environment and turned that into the little ice cave in Ocarina of Time where you learn the water song, but they were able to fully capitalize on the idea here in Majora's Mask. But it's that emotional tone of the game that people remember the most. The fact that this was a much darker feel than a lot of the other Zelda games. It's very sad and depressing, but relatable at the same time. It's kind of a funny coincidence that one of the Zelda games that has the least effect on the timeline itself actually is probably one of the ones where you're the most motivated to go and save the world. Because you see in each person like how the, their lives get better. There's not even actually any villains in the game. All the end bosses are just some corrupted form of entity, be it a fish or a animal that lived in the area. And through the dark power that Majora's Mask has, was corrupted and became the one who was in charge of it. The story feels a little more pure in a sense. The fact that you're not in such a cut and dry world. You know that at the end of the game, some people aren't going to have their happy ending because you can't give it to them, but you can give them more time. And hopefully with that more time, they could use it to solve their issues. Majora's Mask and Dark Souls 2 are probably two of the stories that have stuck with me more than anything else. They're both dark and depressing, but they have a hopeful turn near the end of it. Something that you can kind of wish that was just applied to today. So you can look positively into the future instead of how we've been looking into it for the past. Oh, good lord. How old am I? 29 years? Thank so much for watching the first of my many retrospectives. The next one will be coming soonish, as I haven't really decided on what I want to talk about yet. Uh, maybe Pokemon, Banjo Kazooie, or something else entirely. So, what I'm asking for you is to lend me a hand. Let me know in the comments on down below uh, what you want to hear about or discuss with me. And follow me on Twitch, like and subscribe on YouTube, and even follow me on Twitter to stay in the loop as I try and get out a new video each week. Thank you all so much, and please enjoy the trash meme I made while playing the game.